This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. You know, there's a recent, there's a recent report, it goes clear back to 2014, it was surveyed people who self-identified themselves as Christians on the Christian dating website Christian Mingle. Never heard of it myself, but it's on Christian Mingle. The survey revealed 61% said they are willing to have casual sex without being in love. Not only not being married, but without being in love. And that was 61% of Christians on a Christian dating website said they are okay with trying ca casual sex. Sounds like the message that sex is only for marriage has kind of gotten lost. Uh, what are you seeing, as you, especially as a professor? And yeah. we've seen a lot of young people. Yeah, so I think we have to recognize that culturally there are people that identify as Christian. And so those numbers are, are skewed in the sense that they're representative of people who just are loosely affiliated that. with Christ. And they go to Christian Mingle and find a nice, clean person. Yeah, <laughs> right, think. right. But really, um, I think that a majority of those people probably are not as committed to a Christian fellowship or to the church, right? Now, I say that, but I would also say that in the church, generally, we have become lax on our teaching about sexuality in the last 50 or 60 years. Since the sexual revolution really began back in the 70s, and as it really was, picked up steam. Yeah, as, then, yeah, as a result of cultural shifts. Mm -hmm. But I think that you still will find faithful Christian people recognizing that the Bible does teach abstinence, and the Bible does teach self-control right. as maxims, as guides for our sexual appetites. Well, here's another, another quote. This is from the Huffington Post. Uh, it's an article by the religious columnist, Carol Caravilla. Uh, she concluded, it's time to get real. There's no such thing as a traditional Christian sexual ethic. There's no such thing as a traditional Christian uh, sexual ethic. Often skeptics will point out that, you know, in the Bible you've got incest, you've got polygamy, you've got uh, all kinds of affairs going on, that, and that there isn't really a valid view that you can pull from the Bible about your sexual life. She may be right about a traditional view, but as far as a Christian view, she would be completely wrong. The Bible definitely teaches different ideals for sexual ethics in the New Testament. Um, furthermore, just because the Bible has examples of whatever you may have just mentioned, polygamy yeah. or engagement in some sort of incest all kinds of things. yeah sexual practice that isn't healthy just because the bible includes those things as descriptive doesn't mean that the bible is including them as suggestive or normative and no. i i think that the way that we read the bible we can twist the bible to say whatever we want and we have done that as a culture we've done that as a society so for me i don't really like having the conversation of what does the bible say versus what it doesn't say because as is demonstrated by the by the point you yeah. made, people can twist the Bible to say whatever they well, want it to say. Well, if it's in the Bible, it's okay. Well, that's not true. The Bible is maybe condemning that thing that they're, that they're that's being talked about. Sure. It's, like, it's not uh, necessarily sure. con condoning it. As a pastor and as a father as well, I mean, a lot of times we, parents get lost on how to talk to children, to talk to their young people about sex. And uh, the church may be late to this party about the sexual revolution. That they've, they've just stopped talking about it because they think it's off limits. Parents don't want to talk about it. The kids are going to learn about it in school. When they get into the eighth grade, they're going to have this course on sex. I don't have to even talk about it anymore. But then you, you lose your, your ability to impart a biblical perspective. No, that's exactly right. Sex is a beautiful gift. It's a wonderful mm -hmm. thing. It's something that ought to be celebrated. And like you said, for whatever reason, it's something that we in the church have become afraid of. Well, we in the church are, are the ones who believe that God gave us sex for two really important and wonderful reasons, for reproduction and for pleasure. Mm -hmm. Sex is amazing because of those things. And it has its rightful place in our lives if used correctly, but we haven't, we haven't been teaching very well about the place of sex in the life of a holistic adult. Are, are we paying a price? I mean, we talk about the sexual revolution, paying a price for things like pornography and fantasy lives and whatever it is, romance novels. Uh, we're paying a price for that in marriages. I mean, you talk about, people talking about their marriages now are more open. People talking about, well, we're swingers, we've got an open marriage. Uh, I can go either way. Uh, I can, we, we're using pornography to help our sex life. Think, has, it, has it damaged marriage itself? One of the things that I think is really interesting when I watch the nightly news is how many Cialis or Viagra commercials there are. Yeah, there you go, you got trying to pill. Yeah. Trying to supplement 
help people in their older age as naturally, biologically, our sexual drive decreases. Mm -hmm. Trying to help that drive stay, stay at the same level of our appetite and as our an addiction. an 18-year-old. <laughs> yeah, because we've become so out of control with our sexual appetites. Mm -hmm. What I would say is to, to a couple that is wanting to supplement their sex life in the bedroom with pornography or swinging or whatever it may mm -hmm. be, I would try to help them realize that their priorities as a Christian couple have probably gotten off a bit if they're trying to supplement their sexual, their sexual, their sex life by introducing people outside of the bedroom or objects outside of the bedroom. The, the hope of a Christian marriage is not just to have an awesome sex life. Sex is not the number one priority in marriage. Holiness is the number one priority in marriage. Becoming more Christ-like is the number one priority in marriage. Being a reproductive cu couple, physically, biologically, and spiritually. Hospitality is a much higher priority in Christian marriage than point. sex. Yeah. And so, if you're spending all of your time as a couple trying to enhance your sex life, as a Christian couple, you ought to be asking the question, are our priorities in the right yeah. place? And I would argue probably not. Let's, let's get closer to the edge then, or further from the edge, maybe over the edge, I'm not sure. The whole idea of, of pornography, addiction, uh, self-gratification, uh, and, and it, it's, it's, not just, it's not just a male problem anymore. We're seeing that the, the whole idea of, of sexual fantasy is, is taking over in, the, in, in, in women's lives as yeah, well. Yeah, I think I heard that uh, Fifty Shades of Grey is the number one selling paperback in history, and it certainly weren't men that were buying that, no, and, that and book, right? It, that, that amazed me, but at the same time, where, where do you go with that when someone says, well, I love my wife, or I love my husband, whatever. It's not enough. I'm reading these romance novels. I'm watching porn on my, f my smartphone or whatever. And that's nobody's business but my own. It's self-gratification. So really, this, this is no longer a Christian conversation, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. when, you start, when, we start saying, when we start having a conversation about my needs, gratifying my desires. Yeah. We're, not, we're not being guided by a Christ-like perspective, a selfless perspective. Paul but says- But are we saying, well, well, Christ doesn't care. He'll look, you know, it's, it's, it's what I'm doing for myself. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not hurting anybody else. Well, the, the minute that you say, I'm a follower of Jesus, you resign yourself to not being your own. Paul right. says, you're not your own. You were bought at a price. Christ. Therefore, honor God with your body. Your body's a temple of the Holy Spirit, he says, who's in you. Um, we have this perspective that my body is my own. We have this idea of privatized Christianity that creeps into the bedroom in the sense, or not into the bedroom, really just into my private life, into my fantasy life. And if you're being controlled by your appetite of sexuality more than being guided by a paradigm of, of Christ as Lord, then really you're probably walking away from Christ from and Christ. You're, not, you're not being guided in a way that I would find to be Christian. Now, there will be people out there that but disagree you want with me. People want affirmed, and that's, that's sure. I'm looking for affirmation. But there's people out there that are watching, of course, that uh, say, oh, yeah, they, they, they've really hit a nerve here, and I, I'm not sure what to do with it now. They've hit this nerve, and you can talk to somebody about, uh, I, I did this thing wrong, I did that thing wrong, you can confess a sin. When it gets to sexual ethics, gets to sexual topics, it gets really dicey for people to, conf to confess that. Uh, many people who come into my office who say I have a problem with pornography, for example, what they are doing is they're essentially admitting that they look at pornography mm -hmm. and act on it, but they're not really saying I want a change. They just have felt a nudge, I need to, a conviction I need to confess, to confess, confess it. I need to right? Confess it. Um, and it's good to confess. I would encourage people to confess, but you're not going to come to a, a point of change until you come to a point of brokenness and realize this is ruining my mindset. This mm -hmm. is ruining my worldview. This is ruining my marriage. This mm -hmm. must stop. There really needs to become a place of repentance for, for anyone who's addicted to these types of, types of things. And once you've come to that place, oftentimes you become humble enough to recognize I need other people in my life to help to me. speak into my life. And there really are great organizations all throughout this country, in America, I mean, really, with probably within an hour of wherever you're watching this episode from, um, whether it be a Celebrate Recovery program 
or um, some sort of anonymous program mm -hmm. for people who have struggled with addictions, and even men's or women's groups at local churches, that people that can come alongside of you and help, help you. The people that I've seen have most success getting out of some sort of sexual addiction are people who have come to a place of brokenness and repentance, which has moved them to a place of accountability with some sort of small group community. Mm -hmm. Where people are checking on them, checking in. And they're living into a new reality together. Sexual freedom is possible. It's not just it's not just a hopeful end, it's a possible end. If you'd like more information about Jesus Christ or how to connect to a local church, go to our website or Facebook page. We have a lot more resources there that we can connect you with. Plus, I'd like to hear from you.